friends, comrades, family. Uh, those of you who know Peter, he no, needs no introduction. Those of you who don't, I'm the, probably not the right person to introduce him fully, but uh, I, I want to just say that um, Peter is in town to, to, for the launch of his new book, and um, uh, the book is about May Day, but Dan and I were students of his in 25 years ago when he uh, produced a pamphlet on May Day that was uh, the first of what became a series of pamphlets on May Day, and it, uh, it was a living document that we, we, um, we discussed and, and, and carried around in our back pockets for a long time. Uh, and uh, he was brought out by CUNY, I think, to do a launch and um, uh, had a, recorded a session with Laura Flanders yesterday. And tonight was a chance to just hear some of what he shared with us at CUNY the other night. Um, it's being filmed, so everything is going to be available for others by our, one of our resident filmmakers, Luann. Uh, Peter, please, we, in, we invite you to share with us the book. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, you know, many thanks to, to Dave and to Elizabeth and Layla for the gathering and for the food. And also, um, Ali yeah. and Eli, we ha haven't really met. I'm a scholar. I'm a retired historian or a people's remembrancer, to use an a older expression. And I'm very grateful for the character of Dave's introduction that this <coughs> book is not, now in a way finished because but before all those little pamphlets, year by year, the little leaflets, uh, they lived. They were passed out on the streets and so on. And for this book to live, uh, you readers must make it live. In other words, uh, in a way, my, my job as an off, quote, author is over. But with a pamphlet, your job as an activist is not over. You, that's that's a, important for me to say. And also, uh, I'll address you guys, because it's easier for me to do that, because here there's, they're very emotional for me. Um, my daughter and my grandson and my son-in-law are here, but especially my daughter. She participated in the earliest May Day celebrations that we started doing in the 80s. And then, uh, and, and then later, uh, with the... Dan and Dave, and then who were students at, in uh, the Boston area in Medford, and then with my comrades from Midnight Notes, um, helped with several of the May Day pamphlets, and it's become uh, part of part of us. And so I, I wanted to read to you uh, the note that I wrote for Dave and Lizard when I sent them a copy of the book to just as a personal tone, and perhaps it might help us think about May Day in 2016. I don't know how we'll take it forward. Bringing it back, taking it forward was the uh, Ann Arbor slogan we've had, where I'm from. just in the Bronx listening to Bernie. Here's on the national stage someone talking about socialism. <clears throat> a new generation is interested in socialism. How can we tell them what socialism is? What is communism? What is anarchism? And now it's our job to explain this. This is the feeling that I have. Mm. There's a constitutional crisis they keep talking about. The Supreme Court so much of the whole Constitution is designed to prevent our voices from being heard. It's just to remind you of elementary civics. 
uh, Supreme Court, the Senate, federal system, is all designed against the commons, against common people. That's the system of government. So this issue is raised up, socialism raised up. I write, Dear Dave and Elizabeth, yesterday the UPS delivered my May Day book, Hot from the Printers. Actually, I should say our May Day book, since it couldn't have been written without you, Dave. See page seven. But this is true also of Dan, of George, of Kate, of Monty. We have persisted, have we not? We have not forgotten, have we? We have honored, insofar as our times and capacities permitted, the struggles of our ancestors, the righteous nobility of their dreams, and the faith they reposed in us. We have reason to pause and look behind us at our labors too, and take some satisfaction before resuming our duties, arm in arm, to those still with us and those to come. It's in that spirit that I put those pamphlets with Ramsey, uh, a PM press, you know, in a book. This is, I, I, I feel, you know, it's our duty. These essays were written in a, the times of lead. These were written in in that transition from the Cold War into neoliberalism. And they were written in a certain style, a lonely style, of trying to be light, trying to raise our spirits. But now I feel those times are over, and we have to find ways of writing and speaking directly to the young people who are wondering, what is the alternative to neoliberalism. People want to know, and we should help to tell them, tell them what we think, tell them of those dreams. I asked Dave beforehand, just while we were having supper, whether or not I should tell the name two stories, the green story and the red story, again. And we all should know it. And he said I should. He was expecting Amy Goodman to be here. And I was thinking she might not know these two stories. But the rest of you know the two stories. But in case you don't, or in case you forgot from night before last, um, I will. I'll just please repeat. Do, them. Please. I'll just re I'll just repeat them. And yeah. can you also just hold up the cover? Because we'd like to. That's just not a, cover is. It's a beautiful cover. And, and what's the title the of the book? Can you read the title? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How old are you? What are your What are your, <laughs> what are your favorite hobbies? <laughs> My social security number is <laughs> five seven eight six seven eighteen sixty one. You got that one. And I have a U.S. passport. I'm a retired professor. <laughs> the incomplete, true, yeah, can you read the authentic. The incomplete, true, authentic, and wonderful history of May Day is the mm. title of this book. Great title. Mm -hmm. It's incomplete because we haven't finished our, our work. And there are several stories that are not in here. It's true. There are two stories that I want to tell. It's authentic because it's part of actions, Dave and Dan as showed you, and it's wonderful because tremendous things have happened when we act as a class in a righteous cause. Unexpected, miracles, supernatural, metaphysical, it all, it can happen. We can turn the world upside down, comrades. It happens very quickly. All right. It happened in 1627, that's one time, and it happened in 1886, that's another time. And those are the two dates and the two stories. One is a green story, one is a red story. We need to know them by heart and pass them on to our children, make sure our teachers know about it, and make it assignments for us to learn. This is part, must be part of our blood and breath. The Green Story. 1627, when Thomas Morton from Europe came over to North America, and with the Native Americans of Massachusetts, of Quincy Bay, 
runaway servants and slave, former slaves who had escaped, gay people and straight people, 1627, put up a maypole 80 feet high, antlers on the top, and they wrote the first poetry in English ever written in North, the North American continent. Why weren't we taught this in the, why wasn't this the beginning of our literature classes? With a proclamation of the 1st of May at Marymount shall be kept Holy Day. May Day for them was a holy day. It was a day to hold hands and dance around the maypole, to have pleasure with one another's bodies and drinks and food. And the Puritans of Boston, Cotton Mather and William Brad Bradford, put an end to it because they didn't want abundance, they wanted scarcity. They didn't want pleasure, they wanted people to work. And that's the founding story of the European, African, indigenous American people in North America. Check it out. It's documentary evidence. That's story number one. It's green because of the fertility. And I'm angry because I, this knowledge was kept from us and it's kept from others. This is why I'm angry. Because they mean us to be ignorant of this history. And yeah, so that's the green one. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you tell, do you know why they put antlers on the top of the maple? No. He takes questions at the end usually, but because <laughs> <laughs> you said the green no, story is over. Are you gonna tell us? <laughs> no, but I think it might have something to do with the indigenous or about fertility or, or food or something. So you know the answer then. And okay. how did they get up to the top to put the that's another question. <laughs> Obviously you weren't an engineer. But I mean antlers weren't used in Europe, right? And you in no, Europe, of course they were. They put antlers on top of the maple? On top of things, yeah. They did, didn't they, George? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Did they? So that wasn't that wasn't unique to the Americas to put the antlers on top of the maple. No. Okay. Have you heard reindeer? Have you heard of reindeer? <laughs> yes. That's the indigenous <laughs> people of Scandinavia. Scandinavia. They have antlers. <laughs> the magic. Yeah. No, it was. I I don't know. You don't know. I didn't. No, I just I never know. heard of antlers on top of a maple. But I love the image. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can't. Oh, I feel like I could see one out there. A maple <laughs> with antlers on it. Uh, I think it's gonna happen. But beware of Peta. Maple. Well, Dan and Dave and Monty could tell us because we took a maypole to the bank of Boston yes, indeed. at lunchtime, didn't we? Oh yeah, we had a great time. We assembled a maypole. It was, oh, 15 feet tall, not yeah. a super tall one. Yeah. But we had a big base that would hold it steady. And we were, our friend John Wilshire, also known as Johnny Manana, we put it together in his basement and so on and built it. And we had the big pole, went down, stuck the pole in. We already had the ribbon attached so we didn't have to climb it. And we danced around the maypole and we put on a pro Zapatista skit right in front of the Bank of Boston. Our goal was to disrupt as much work as possible. And I must say that we had people literally by the hundreds in the windows stopping work to watch us. Yeah. Now, many of them joined us, a few did, but it was our goal was to join us. But we had 20 or 30 of us who went down and danced around the plaza, yeah. really small plaza. Yeah. It wasn't much bigger than this, but it, was a, it, it did the job. And the Bank of Boston had to do with the apartheid, did it? Oh. You name it. Yeah. I mean, you can trace it back. Fleet Bank before that. They were uh -huh. big in the slave trade, as uh -huh. I recall. I mean, you know, anything you want to name, they were. Yeah. They're now part of Bank of America, so, you know. And the workers were grateful yeah. for us. We did it at lunchtime <coughs> to, you know, to make sure. But, so what is a maple? Well, didn't they, ex well, we got yeah. some, uh, I think, Grim Clark and us. We went to a hardware store. We got two sections of piping and put them together. Um, yeah. So it's a, like a pipe that's as high as you can make it. Can you put a ribbon on it? And that, no, you put many ribbons. And then each person holds a ribbon, you know, out like this. So and then you tent. tent and you weave in and out. And what's the history of the maple? Where did it and, begin? And, and as you weave in and out, it wraps around, it wraps around a particular pattern depending on how you dance. And then you have to do the same dance in the other direction to unweave it. I know, it's 
It's amazing. This is dancing around a maple. Used to people do it all the time. Okay, because it's a, it's the time when the sun is closer to the temperate regions. That, that this part of the of the globe, the planet. Yeah, it's, it's still. Spring. Uh, I think in Scandinavia, there for the solstice, there's lots of maple uh, hmm. celebrations. Yeah, it, there is all over. The, th the thing is, is you can read about it here <coughs> as well. Even you can get some of these Bank of Boston stories that, that'll be referred to, and other stories, especially from olden times. That's what I'm good at. <coughs> um, you had a question again? What was it? Yeah, yeah, there was the, the, history, history, of the, the history of the maypole. The history of the maypole, yeah, it, it goes back. I mean, it's, it's probably... But how far? As, well, to Neolithic times, I, I believe. Does it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, it's part of the fertility symbols. And would they normally use trees, obviously? It would be the, the, yeah. originally be a tree. Yeah, it have to do with tree worship. And um, and you find it not just in the tree PVC, regions. it was... Okay. <laughs> Four or five regions. Yeah. <laughs> where, where else do you find it, Peter? Besides the temperate regions? In in Africa, in no. west west East Africa. And it was about changing the season. Change of the season, right? I think maybe yeah. that was like something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Change of season. Change of season, right? It's the start of the new season. Right? Start of a new season. Yeah, that would make sense. Of planting, so that gr grasses can grow. Because the grasses get the, because of photosynthesis, they get the energy from the sun. The sun. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's a main miracle that people want to happen. Because then that food will be used for us to eat, and then that that pleasure enables us to work and do things. Mm -hmm. So that's the key, decisive step in human history. Of at least since Neolithic times. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that the people in the cities and the rulers mm -hmm. didn't do the work. Yeah. Okay. In fact, they made other people work. And your mom painted workers here who used the sickle, mm -hmm. which is what the women are doing here. They're cutting the grain with a sickle. And they're chatting with each other. You know, they're having, they're doing the work with some pleasure. Mm -hmm. And they can stand up or sit down, and there's no boss telling them exactly how to do it. Mm -hmm. And they're leaving stuff left over for others. That's called gleaning. And the way that they put an end to it. Does your dad have a, an electric shaver or a hand sh shaver? Hand shaver. Okay, but some people have electric shaver. Mm -hmm. So they would so that if you liken the sickle to a hand shaver, mm -hmm. they would they made in Chicago a mechanical sh reaper. So instead of a uh, sickle, a machine now cuts the grass on the great prairies. Like a lawn like a lawnmower. Mm. So the earth is no longer Mother Earth, place where all creatures can live, antlers or not, or not. But now it's just a place to grow grain to be cut by machines. The earth has become a, an aspect of constant capital. It's now a commodity to be bought and sold. Hello, Michaela. <laughs> Hi. I'm glad you can pause. Okay, I'm in the middle of a, of a, a talk. We right? didn't talk. A it was a rowdy. No, who did this painting? Yeah. Really? We didn't know who did it. And Ramsey, the publisher, I called him up before and said, can you tell us who did this? He didn't know. I said, call up the, the designer. He didn't know either. He's on the road to L.A. <laughs> but there was one, now here's my stereotype. There was one worker at this launch. And it happens that she was African-American. She knew how to put this image into Google 
and in a reverse process, found out who the who the painter was and when it was painted. So this is cuning. You know, our tax dollars are at work and doing good research. You know, I was so happy to learn this. Layla, yes. thank you for paying attention here because I wanted to get back to the machine, this mechanical reaper. Right? Yeah. The guys who made it were called molders. They were, they, and they, many of them were uh, immigrants from Europe, skilled workers from Europe, working in Chicago. And the guy who owned the whole plant was named McCormick, and his rate of profit was 71%. And he wanted to make it even higher. And the way he made it higher was by cutting wages, 15%. And the workers went out on strike. McCormick called the police because the police were McCormick's servants, basically. And the police came and they shot four strikers. They got people got were furious over this, absolutely furious, and said, "We have to have a meeting." And they had the meeting in Chicago at Hay Market. Why did they have hay? Why did they have hay in Chicago in 1886? To feed the horses? Yes, to feed the horses, because they didn't have cars. They didn't have petroleum but for you know, the automobile civilization. People went on horses, and horses needed to have hay. That was their, their fodder, right? You've heard the expression, eat like a horse. So they go to Haymarket, thousands of people, to discuss. These are anarchists, socialists, communists, immigrants from different parts of Europe, Native Americans, including Jackson, a Métis from Canada, African American, some like Lucy Parsons, English like Sam Fielden, who had been a Methodist preacher in a cotton mill in Liverpool. I know all these, some of these names and some of these, these men and women, and you should too, because they were fighting for the eight hour day. They were fighting to reduce the rate of profit. They didn't believe that profiteering was a basis of serving other people. How could you serve other people and work for other people while profiting from them? You had to force them to labor. They were against forced labor. This was called the beautiful idea or the Chicago idea. It was. Police and the courts were in the pocket of McCormick, and four were hanged. Four were hanged by the neck until they were dead, including August Speeds. But before August Speeds choked to death, here's what he said A day will come. And our silence will be more powerful than the voices you throttle today. Those were his last words. And so when I met Dan and Dave, we wrote a pamphlet and we called it When the Silent Speak, because we thought it was time to once again remember why August Spees, Albert Parsons, George Engel, and Fisher were hanged. Because all over Europe, all over the world, they made May Day a holiday for workers and for the eight-hour day, the shorter working day, an end to forced exploitation. Well, you might not have a good, a favorable idea of the ruling class, that combination of police, employers, and engineers, but they are clever. And what they did to this, they said, okay, you can have your Labor Day, but not on May Day. We'll put it in September. And instead, we're gonna make May Day, we're gonna call it Law Day. <laughs> These are the two big lies of the ruling class that we are taught. The wise among us 
decide not to pay attention to history because it's mainly lies by the ruling class. But if you rely on your people's remembrancer, or better, on your own study, you can learn from the past and you can remember those words and the struggle for the shorter day and the struggle to celebrate May Day. That's so those are the two stories. The second was the red. You were, you, you, the blood? The second was the red, the red story. That's the yes. class struggles. That's the traditional struggle with the communist parties. Actually, I sh the anarchists led it. And they led the May Day. We learned the other night from Sherry that, it, that the anarchists at Union Square in the 1920s led the May Day thing. The, the CP didn't come in until the 1930s. That was what her research had revealed. Would that have been Emma Goldman? Yeah, she would be involved in this, okay. definitely. Yeah. She, she came, she was very active to save the lives of the Haymarket martyrs. Now you might say, how did I remember all of this? Well, I don't remember it. I had to learn it. And the way that we learned it is from people in Mexico. Because they were not subject to those lives. They honored the history of Mayday. The martyrs. The martyrs. The, the what? Marti the martyrs. Yeah, the martyrs. Martyrs. Those martyrs. Yeah. How'd you like that? Yeah, that'll be a test. It'll <laughs> <laughs> be a test because every May Day, every May Day, all of us in this room will be celebrating. One month from now, we'll be thinking, what are we going to do on this May Day, this holiday? Every year, that's what we'll have to think. What day in May? The 1st of May. It's a Sunday this year. It is a day of rest. Good. <laughs> busy day, busy. Who of our, our good friend's child is here that day? Oh, the May child. And the test, will that be something where we can bring books and notes, or we have to take it without any? <laughs> Do we use an iPhone? Is Don't it an app or an <laughs> iPhone system? By all means, the test, you will find the test in the streets with... I don't know. By a test. You know, people will say to you, why are you marching today? Why are you dancing today? And you will find some reasons to answer that. That's, that's the test. Because you must explain, you must teach others, just as you've learned tonight. This is a message we have to carry on. So May Day now also is a big day for immigrants, immigrant rights. They mm -hmm. use that day starting what six years ago with huge marches all over the country in many cities. And in many cities they still do it, haven't been as big, but in Boston every year. I don't go every year, but I go frequently. That's when they did this year. That was 2006. Yeah. We wore white. That was the sign of that day. Is the maypole so, still a symbol anywhere that you know of? Or? Maypole? Yeah. In those? No. Not necessarily, no. It's just the day. No, there's purchase. a certain relationship to workers, but I have not seen expressed a relationship to me. But there is, suppose, like in Boston, the environmental people are talking about something around that. And also, um, there's an annual, uh, Jamaica, where I live in Boston, there's a neighborhood called Jamaica Plains. So there's an annual festival in the spring, often on May Day, um, or right about it on the weekend. <clears throat> and they have bands and dancing and food and all the usual stuff. So a number of years ago, I have no idea, I still do not know who did it. Peter had left Boston, living here. But somebody had taken you know, those big sheets of plywood, four by eight and written out large parts, if not the whole thing, of the original May Day pamphlet, the, the red and the green. Oh, really? And wrote it out on the boards. And they yeah. extended, like 20 of these boards would extend along a fencing. Wow. Along. And people would stop and read parts. And there's still like, last year I was there, because our friend Hans was there. Hans and Daniela were there. And it happened to be then, so we walked over and walked around. And lo and behold, a few panels, Supplemented by others that refer to Africa, to this or that, the people they created and sort of put there. So there's sort of like a branching out. It's almost a delight to see what shows up. I have no idea what, like I said, I do not know who did it. Mm. 
can, can I ask a question about the Haymarket? Uh, in, why was the strike on May 1st in 1886? Very good question. This goes back to the American Civil War which was the war against slavery in the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery except for those in prison or those convicted of a crime. This encouraged many other people, especially disabled people, because there were so many disabled people mm. from the Civil War, <coughs> disabled rights. It encouraged women to struggle for the vote. It encouraged workers to struggle for a shorter working day. And so the union of, of uh, the Confederation <laughs> of Labor Unions of the United States and Canada resolved in 1868 that after the 1st of May, 1886, eight hours shall be the working day. That's the origin of the eight hour movement. Lincoln had been assassinated, but he had also proposed an eight hour working day. He was also hmm. um, Oh yeah, but what came up the other night, which I think is important for us to remember and difficult for us to, to remember, is this confederation of Canadian and U.S. labor unions declared that eight hours shall be the working day. So that meant that at the end of eight hours, you left the job got that? Mm -hmm. They didn't ask the government or the employers, is that okay with you? No. <laughs> so this was direct action, not petitioning your representative in Congress or asking Bernie or Obama for permission or your teachers. That's the origin of the eight-hour struggle. 